Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, I actually would probably rather have had major surgery this morning than perform it. Um, I'm sorry that I missed this morning's session, and I'm delighted to be included on the program. My initial comments this morning were going to relate to the management of peritoneal mesothelioma to try and complement Dr. Taub and Dr. Ping Pang's lectures. Uh, I think some of the material that I was going to cover was included this morning, and what I'd like to do instead, and I talked to Dr. Vogel saying about this, is focus on a portion of that talk that relates to, a, I think, a very important topic in cancer research, a more global topic uh, that I think is particularly relevant to mesothelioma research and to the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. This is my new home for those of you who uh, remember, I was at the NIH for many years with Drs. Pink Pank and Dr. Bartlett, where the perfusion program, I think, had its, its origins that has continued very successfully at the University of Pittsburgh and one that we're developing actively here at the University of Maryland in, uh, in Baltimore. And the, um, oh, I don't have a pointer here, but that's okay. Uh, the medical center actually is quite a, um, quite a facility. This is the... Um, uh, really, the University of Maryland Baltimore campus that has seven graduate schools, including the School of Medicine and a 700 bed acute care uh, um, treatment facility. This is a pointer. I'm... There we go. Thank you very much. What I wanted to point out was that the, um, the medical school itself is actually the fourth oldest medical school and the oldest public medical school in the country, started in 1807. And this is the original building right here, which is the oldest. Uh, building in the Northern Hemisphere that has been continuously used for medical education. Now, excuse me while I scroll through the beginning part of this talk, because I really want to focus on the second portion of my talk, because I don't want to cut into Mary's um, presentation uh, to any great degree. A lot of this, I think, was covered. I've got three more here, and then I think of, yep. What I wanted to talk about was a very important topic to me, and it's something that I've become acutely sensitive to since I've made this transition from the NIH to um, academics, uh, which is really the issue of funding for cancer research. I think the complexion of cancer research and its funding uh, in the year 2008 is in very, very tough shape. Uh, funding for the NIH has uh, decreased over the last four to five years, and based upon the um, economics of um, uh, of the uh, federal budget, I don't think that we're going to have significant increases in research funding at a federal level for some time to come. But what has happened, I think, is a very important development, which has a very kind of interesting historical origin to it. And I just wanted to share that with you this morning to put in perspective where we've come and why or how our biomedical research infrastructure has developed the way it has and why an organization such as MARF is going to be an increasingly important type of organization uh, as it partners with researchers uh, to develop um, cure, uh, new ways to cure and prevent mesothelioma. I want to introduce this family to you. This gentleman here is Hamilton Jordan. That's his wife, Dorothy. They're three children, Hamilton Jr., Kathleen, and Alexander. Uh, I was very fortunate this year uh, to have met Mr. Jordan. He was a patient of mine who recently succumbed to peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, Mr. Jordan was, as everyone knows, a very prominent individual in the Carter administration, was credited with uh, crafting the strategy that uh, ultimately won Jimmy Carter the White House. He was his chief of staff. And Jimmy Carter said at his funeral that all of the good things that happened during his presidency were, were, were really the result of the hard work of Hamilton Jordan. After he left politics, he became very active in cancer research and supporting programs for cancer research. He has had six separate cancers in his life. This was the one that ultimately he succumbed to, which was mesothelioma. He wrote this book, which I recommend to everybody, which I think puts things into a remarkable perspective in terms of living with cancer and, uh, and the challenges that it poses to an individual and one's family. As I said, he was a cancer survivor, and he chose to take this challenge in his life and devote his energies, and his wife devoted her energies, really to the service of great causes and to, um, and to help others uh, in, in, in fighting this, this condition. 
He was the founder of the $1 billion Georgia Cancer Coalition, which is a very innovative state-level strategy to generate a bond to raise funds specifically for cancer research funded at the state level. Texas is doing the same thing. We have talked about the possibility of doing this in Maryland, and I think that these types of state-level funding programs are going to become increasingly important in the future. He was a board member of the Lance Armstrong Foundation, the American Association of Cancer Researchers, and others. And as I said, he was a remarkably public and effective advocate for cancer research funding. He had two points that he made when he spoke in public, and I wanted to just uh, recount those to you here because they are remarkable. The first is that since President Nixon declared the war on cancer by signing the National Cancer Act of 1972, we have spent only about, on average, 0.25% of our federal funds on cancer research, a disease that is predicted to afflict almost half of all Americans by the year 2020. Cancer is now the number one cause of death in all Americans under the age of five in this country, and over 650,000 individuals lose their struggle with this condition every year. And this is a very sobering statistic that every six months we spend more money on the war in Iraq than we have spent in total in 35 years on cancer research since the National Cancer Act was enacted in 1972. It's a remarkable statistic. And this is the graph showing that as we've gotten better at managing heart disease, but not better at managing the mortality from cancer, that in fact cancer is now the number one cause of death starting in the year 2002 in all Americans under the age of 85. Now, the point that I find particularly um, difficult for me now having to go from the intramural program to the extramural program and finding funding for my own research program in mesothelioma is that currently the pay line for investigator-initiated research proposals in the United States is less than 10%. For every 100 research proposals that are submitted to the government for funding, only eight will be funded. And yet, half of these are thought after preliminary review to be of potentially high impact and important proposals. So a significant number are going unfunded. Now, that reminds me of a very interesting story that I'd like to share with you, because I'm concerned that we may not be smart enough to know where the great next discovery in cancer research is going to come. We try very best. We've got a very robust review process that looks for the best science, but are we really going to be able to always know where the, where the great next discovery will come from? We all know. We all talk about the discovery of penicillin, the discovery of uh, many, many of the greatest discoveries in science were ones that were unexpected and unanticipated. And another point is that for most of the 20th century, oh, here's my example. I want to tell you an interesting story. For, the la for most of the 20th century, the medical community treated peptic ulcer disease, a very common condition in this country, with antacids because we, as a profession, were convinced that the, the basis of this disease was a very simple phenomenon. It was too much acid production in the stomach, and you basically controlled that Initially, we did it with surgery to cut the acid-producing uh, nerves of the stomach, and then when antacids became available that were better and more effective, we, uh, we switched to antacids. Now, about 20 years ago, these two physicians, one a pathologist and one a gastroenterologist, became curious about a finding that they saw in biopsies obtained from ulcer patients. Within these tissues, where the ulcers had been biopsied, they saw little inclusions, which they could not understand. And they were curious as to whether or not these may have something to do with the cause of the ulcer disease. Now, their research at that time was met with considerable skepticism in the biomedical research community. In fact, there were people who were authorities in the field who said that there was really very little significance to the work that they were doing. Their hypothesis was contrary to the prevailing wisdom of the day. Their hypothesis was that these little inclusions might be bacteria, bacteria that were growing in the lining of the stomach that could be causing the ulcers and causing the excess acid. 
and that it's not the excess acid that causes the ulcers, but the bacterial infection. And my question is, having known that in fact their research was considered of marginal significance and was actually discounted as relevant by many leaders in the field, would they have been one of the 10% who would have received funding? Well, it's interesting because in 2005, they won the Nobel Prize for their work in the understanding that, that ulcers are caused by Helicobacter pylori. They went counter to the prevailing wisdom. They investigated a hypothesis, and they were rewarded by the highest accolade that can be uh, given in biomedical research. This Nobel Prize was given for their understanding that it was, in fact, a bacteria. And in fact, Dr. Warren famously infected himself with Helicobacter pylori. He was so convinced that his hypothesis was correct, developed ulcers, and then cured himself with a course of antibiotics. And so this just goes to show you a very important point that I don't think we're always smart enough to know where the next great discoveries in, in, in research are going to come. So where are the roadblocks in cancer research? Well, I would maintain that it's not due to re insufficient research facilities. We have the best research facilities are in this country that are present anywhere in the world. And every research facility in this country is capable of doing more productivity. We don't have any lack of space. I don't think we have any lack of ideas. We have investigators who are investing considerable time and energy to write proposals for funding, knowing that they have no more than an 8% chance of getting funded. We have the best minds in science working in cancer research. The real problem is lack of funds. It is the fuel to drive the discovery engine forward that we are now missing. And with federal funding decreasing, we are facing a crisis in cancer research. So I want to digress and close my circle with just a few more slides. How did we get where we are today? And what is going on today, I think, has its roots in what happened almost 100 years ago in this country. And it starts with a story of two young individuals, these two right here. This is Bessie Daschle. This picture was taken when she was about 16 years old in the late 1880s. And this is her friend, who she met through her brother. They were classmates at a private school in Manhattan. And based on the correspondence that existed between them, there was speculation amongst historians that if she had survived and lived through a full measure of life, that they would have gotten married. They had a great, deep, affectionate, and respectful relationship. But fate had another plan for Bessie Daschle when she was traveling across country after her last year of high school. She noted a swelling on the back of her hand. And she thought it was uh, uh, from an injury in the uh, railroad car. She sought medical attention from a young surgeon in New York City who initially biopsied the tissue thinking it was infectious. And it came back as cancer. And despite his best attempts to control that cancer, it recurred over and over again until November of 1888 when she underwent the draconian measure of a forearm amputation. This beautiful young 18-year-old girl had her arm amputated for, for relief of severe pain due to this cancer growing in her arm. But the story gets even sadder. After that operation, she never left the hospital. She died two months later as this cancer ravaged her body. That affected the surgeon very, very profoundly. He actually then went on to devote his career to biomedical research and developed a uh, treatment called Coley's toxins after his name, Dr. Coley, which was, I think, the forerunner of immunotherapy treatments in this country. Her friend was John D. Rockefeller, Jr., who went on, as all of you know, to live as the richest man in the world for many years during the first part of the last century. John D. Rockefeller was so affected by her death that he actually withdrew from college after his freshman year, and he spent a year at home at the family compound before he could return back to public life. He devoted his career to cancer research. This was an unprecedented vision at that time. People with cancer were commonly kept in asylums. They were kept in the perimeter of urban areas because we had no effective treatments for them. 
But he had a different idea. He said, we can beat this disease. He gave great portions of his vast personal fortune to the conquest of cancer. He built the Rockefeller University in the Upper East Side of New York. And then he bought the land across the street to create the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center because he reasoned that great discoveries in science need to be partnered with hospitals so that these discoveries can be immediately translated into clinical research and clinical application. It was an unprecedented vision. And in fact, it is the basis, it is the model for which or by which we have built our whole biomedical research infrastructure here in the United States. And in fact, when asked late in life, why did he devote all of these fortunes to cancer research? He said, I think it goes back to Bessie Daschle. Her death came to me as a great shock. Well, now in this country, we have scores of comprehensive cancer centers, all of them, all of them built on the model that John D. Rockefeller established 100 years ago with basic science parted with clinical activities and many of them built or at least initiated with philanthropic support by individuals who were dedicated to the same vision that John Rockefeller had 100 years ago. So what is the point here? The points are these. Number one, cancer research needs in this country a higher priority. It is incontestable that there are numerous high priority, potentially high impact research uh, proposals that are going unfunded. Number two, we need to be innovative about how we fund cancer research. And I think one of the areas would be to have states start initiating programs like the Georgia Cancer Coalition and the Texas Bond Fund to directly fund cancer research for research programs within those states. But most importantly, I think that something has to happen which is happening here. This is a uniquely American phenomenon, a partnership that exists between citizens and, profession, and professionals towards the conquest of a disease. This is going to be, I think, an increasingly important uh, dimension to cancer research in this country. And it's exactly what, Dr., uh, what Mr. Rockefeller envisioned 100 years ago, partnership. And there are now organizations that are becoming increasingly important in providing the resources to drive the discovery engine forward, like the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation with all of the uh, research funding that it, uh, that it uh, gives every year. The Lance Armstrong Foundation, the Susan Komen Foundation, the American Cancer Society, and there are many others. And so I look at this organization as an exemplar one that I think is going to really be a leadership organization to show the cancer community how to make progress. And I really can't underestimate how important this is. And I think that I thank everyone here for their support of the, of the Mesothelium Applied Research Foundation. And I think it's a remarkable organization. So I just wanted to tell you this story because I think it puts things in perspective uh, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here together. Thank you very much. Thank you.